a start here. Uh, so thank you all uh, so much for uh, the fantastic turnout today uh, for the next Hydra Terra webinar series. Uh, today we have a very exciting presentation for you all as uh, we're joined by some special guests from Vaporpin uh, in looking at the uh, the best practices uh, for, for vapor data collection. So joining us today, uh, as always, for the presentations we have from Hydroterra, uh, our general manager, Michelle, who will be overseeing the proceedings today and uh, making sure it all runs smoothly. Uh, as always, thanks, Michelle, uh, thanks, Michelle for making these uh, run as smoothly as possible. Uh, my name is uh, Kyle McLaren. Uh, I am the uh, sales manager here at Hydroterra. Um, uh, and can assist with anything you require locally from uh, vapor pin, uh, from the equipment itself through to uh, installation. Uh, we have uh, Laurie Chilcott, the Director of Sales and Marketing at Cox Colvin and uh, Director and Vice President of Vapor Pin Limited. And uh, Laurie is responsible for uh, the managerial and technical uh, oversights for all sales of the vapor pin, both within uh, USA and internationally. Uh, she's responsible uh, in education to the environmental community on vapor pin technology, uh, implementation and quality control. Uh, and we're also joined by Craig Cox, the president and principal scientist at Cox Colvin uh, and the inventor of the patented vapor pin, which is used extensively uh, worldwide. Uh, Craig's background uh, is in geology, uh, mineralogy and hydrogeology uh, and provides lectures and presentations at numerous uh, regional and international conferences uh, on topics uh, like groundwater contaminant migration, assessment of vapor intrusion and migration pathways. Um, so we're very grateful to have these guests with us today to talk to us. So thank you guys for taking the time uh, all the way from the beautiful state of Ohio. Uh, I'll just run you through uh, a quick introduction uh, and a quick bit of housekeeping before I hand over uh, to Laurie and Craig to present today. Um, but firstly, uh, as we always do here, you'll see a little uh, Q&A box on your screen, uh, which will allow you to type uh, any questions you may have throughout the presentation. And uh, at the end, I'll read these out to be answered by either Craig, Laurie, or myself, if need be. Um, you can let me know at the end of your question if you would like uh, to remain an, uh, anonymous when I read it, uh, if you so choose. Uh, but uh, uh, please, I encourage you all just to ask whatever questions you may have, and we will most certainly answer them. Uh, so for those of you uh, who may be joining us for the first time here on this series of webinars, uh, our objectives here at Hydroterra are uh, always to share the uh, valuable sources of knowledge uh, on technologies, uh, not only from ourselves, but also directly from our suppliers when we can, uh, such is the case today. Uh, as we see, you know, this is one of the most effective ways to knowledge share uh, to a broad number of people and keep the industry uh, up to date with the latest and greatest and sort of uh, methodologies and technologies. Um, you know, this will also be in the form uh, of training through these webinars or in a more personalized setting to allow, you know, for the appropriate adoption of these technologies in the future. Uh, we also see this as a good platform as well uh, for you to share with us your industry needs, uh, what you guys are looking for. Uh, chances are, uh, we will have a solution or at least an idea to point you in the right direction uh, for your particular monitoring needs. So always encourage uh, to reach out uh, when you need. Whoops. Um, so as I might have mentioned earlier, the program for today will be taken by Lauren Craig to run you through uh, some of the tools available and how these should be utilised for best, uh, best practices of vapour collection. Uh, I'll let Laura and Craig tell you a bit more in detail uh, the things that we're talking about today, along with the various sort of uh, vapor pin um, makeups and products which are available um, outside of just your, your standard vapor pins, which you uh, might be accustomed to, uh, such as the vapor pin mini, uh, the insert, and the flex. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, a few case studies as well, which they'll uh, run through. And uh, as I mentioned, they will do our uh, Q and A uh, at the end. So uh, yeah, Cox Colvin uh, patented the vapor pin back in 2011, and and since then the products have been uh, utilised in a, a wide and numerous amount of applications here in Oz. Um, you know, including sub slab sampling, stray gas evaluations, and source characterization, that sort of thing. And uh, we at Hydroterra have represented uh, Vaporpin as the exclusive distributor and have done so for, for many years now. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to Laurie and Craig uh, to begin their presentation, and uh, I'll pick it up uh, at the end with, with any of your questions. Um, so, Laurie uh, and Craig, if you want to uh, share your screen and, and take over, that'd be great. Hi, thanks for joining us for Successful Air and Vapor Data Collection Best Practices. My name is Lori Chilcote. Craig Cox will be joining me periodically. Um, we want to share the most important things you should think about before you even go out into the field. We're going to do um, a live demonstration of an installation, a shut-in leak test, a helium leak test, as well as some specific active soil gas sampling tools. But first, you really need to think about what you're trying to accomplish. So let's start there. So before you even go out to the field, you need to think about the goal you're trying to achieve. So you can analyze which tool is going to get you the data that you need to get you the answers that you require, saving yourself time and money. Um, hello, I'd like to now uh, show you how to install a vapor pen. And we're gonna try and do a couple of things here this morning. Uh, one is we're gonna install a, uh, this is a flex vapor pen. It's got a little, the barb fitting can come off. This is the silicone sleeve that, that will form your seal. You'll see you set it not quite to the top, uh, just enough so that you're at, at, at about the last barb. Now this may change for each uh, uh, different concrete setting that you're in. Some concrete seem to grip a little bit more than others. So once you put in a few, then you'll, you'll know how yours is gonna react. Uh, we've already drilled a 5 8 inch hole through the slab and we've cleaned it with the uh, shop bag. Uh, the installation extraction handle you'll get with the kit uh, or you can buy separately has a hole in one end that fits over the barb so that you can uh, not so you don't damage the barb fitting and it allows you to pound it in. So I'll do that now. Will you be showing us a shut-in leak test as well? Yes, and part of this part of this demonstration will show you how to leak test with a water dam, how to leak test with a water dam and a pressure test, which is what which is probably what you'd like to do in all cases. So you first start in start the vapor pin in the hole, then you place the insulation extraction tool on top, and you simply pound it in like a nail. And that's all you need to do. So the seal is immediate. Um, there's, and it just goes in. You'll see a little bit of a bulge around the outside. That's normal. Um, if you have too much of that, you might want to remove it, start the sleeve a little lower, and then pound it in again. So the next thing you would do, you would purge the point. After you've let it set for a while, you'd purge the point to make sure you're getting soil gas. And then you can connect up your sampling train so this would go back to a suma can and you'd be ready to sample now what i want to show you right now is how to uh, leak test this with a water dam and you made that uh yourself correct yeah this this is some homemade play-doh um it, it's important that you keep as few v or as that you introduce as few vocs to the site as possible so we're using a a homemade uh, Play-Doh that is made out of baking soda and cornstarch and water and we'll have that we have that um, recipe on our website if you want to try and use that so you basically make a snake around the bottom of this coupling that comes with 
with our kits. Okay. Then you place that over the your sample train, snug it down, and then fill that void with uh, water. And the idea being that if the water stays within above the connections, then you don't have a leak. So now you can start sampling. Now the next one I want to show you is a, a flush mount setting. So here's a vapor pin that's been installed previously and has a secure cover on it. You have this special spanner tool that you can engage the lid with and unscrew the secure cover. And the secure cover has uh, threads on it that allow it to attach right to the vapor pin. So there's no other, other kind of uh, attachments you need. You take out the little cap that goes on a little vinyl cap that's on there. Or it's actually silicone. Uh, and then we're gonna show you how to pressure test before you sample. So what we have here is a hand pump that goes through a valve. Then we have another pressure gauge in the middle. Uh, then that runs up to a, a valve at the top and a T fitting, which goes into your SUMA can. Now this SUMA can, you know, you want to make sure all of these connections are tight. And that's what you're testing is how, how tight is this connections. Finally, this part of the T fitting runs over to a va valve at this end that's closed. So you want to close off everything back to this uh, hand pump so you can pump up the pressure. So you pump the pressure up and you can see on this valve or on this gauge, we're getting some pressure. And then we'll let that set. And you can see it's slowly dropping a little bit. And that's because these hand pumps are notorious for leaking. So that's why we have this other valve here. So you can turn this valve and shut off the hand pump and you'll see now that the pressure is steady. So that means that none of the, none of this part of the system is leaking. On these alpha uh, SUMA cans, they also have a gauge here that you can turn on and you can monitor the pressure there. It just doesn't show up very well on the video. So once you have it figured out that you're, you're set and you're, you're tight, turn this valve to isolate this portion because you don't want that to be in the sampling. Connect this to the vapor pin. Check your valves again. Then you can open this valve. Now you have a connection between this portion of the, you know, where your sub slab is all the way back through here. And this valve is now, when you're ready to sample, you open that valve. And you, and you have a built-in water dam. Yeah, and so now you have a built-in water dam with the flush mount. So if, if you want to test that, you just fill that with water. And again, you watch that. <laughs> <laughs> a couple bugs came out. Now you watch that um, and make sure there isn't any you know, water uh, leaking through the, the around the vapor pen. So the idea being that water won't, you know, the air, indoor air won't go beyond the water. At that point, turn on your valve and you're ready to test. Helium shroud leak testing, discussion and demonstration. There are two main types of helium shroud leak testing. The first method involves only leak testing the sample point, while the second method leak tests the entire sample train at the same time. First, a quick word about helium. Generally, the two types of helium that are available for use are lab-grade helium and so-called balloon helium. Lab-grade helium is extremely pure, ensuring that should a leak occur, the sample will not be compromised. However, it can be expensive and difficult to obtain. Balloon-quality helium is often found at stores for consumer use and may contain other volatile organic compounds. If a leak occurs, these VOCs can contaminate the sample or affect reporting limits. While it is easier to obtain, it can jeopardize sample integrity. Quantitative helium leak testing of the sample point. This leak testing method allows for leaks to be corrected prior to sample collection, ensuring sample quality and helping avoid costly resampling. Less cumbersome than the fully enclosed testing we will demonstrate later, this method is often combined with the shut-in test of the sample train. 
Firstly, the sample point, in this case a vapor pin, is covered by the shroud. This shroud has three ports, one for measuring helium levels in the shroud, a second for supplying helium to the shroud, and a third for purging the sample point. Connect the purge tubing to the sample point securely. Connect the helium detector to the shroud measurement port and fill the shroud with helium until an adequate concentration is reached. This concentration is often dependent on guidance and or laboratory reporting limits. Once an adequate helium concentration has been measured in the shroud, connect the helium detector to the purge port and monitor it. If no helium is detected, no leak is indicated. If helium is detected, check connections and the sample point. Although very unlikely to leak, the vapor pin's design allows for easy reinstallation. Following the helium leak test of the sample point, the shroud can be removed and the tubing disconnected. The point is now ready for sampling. Quantitative helium leak testing of the entire sample train. This method ensures very high data quality by fully enclosing the sample point and sample train. Due to this method's complexity, however, it can be difficult to collect multiple samples and may increase costs. This shroud is slightly different than the previous shroud. It features the same port configuration, but also a three-way valve with connections to the purge port, sample point, and the sample itself. The sample manifold and configuration used in this demonstration may vary from others that are available, so be sure to check with your equipment provider about the proper usage of the shroud. First, connect the sample tubing to the sample point. Next, connect the sample to its respective tubing. Then, ensure that the shroud is well seated on the ground surface to reduce any helium loss. Connect the helium supply to the shroud and begin adding helium. Next, connect the helium detector to the shroud monitoring port and measure the concentration of helium in the shroud until the target has been met. Alternatively, a standalone helium monitor can be placed fully inside the shroud to measure the concentration instead of using a port. Next, we will begin the process of purging the sample point. Adjust the valve accordingly and connect the helium detector to the purge port. Purge a large enough volume of soil gas to meet your data quality objectives while also monitoring the helium concentration as before. Once the sample train has been demonstrated to be free of leaks, you can begin sampling. Helium shroud leak testing is a tried and true method for leak testing soil gas sampling points. Some advantages include the ability to identify leaks in real time prior to collecting a sample. Another advantage is the inert characteristics of helium gas, meaning that if a leak does occur, the sample isn't compromised. However, helium leak testing also has a few disadvantages, including increased costs and logistics. It should also be noted that helium leak detectors can provide false positives in the presence of methane, which can undermine their use at petroleum or chlorinated VOC vapor intrusion sites where methane may be present in the subsurface. Please note, this video demonstration is meant only to illustrate the helium shroud leak testing process. Always consult all relevant guidance and work with environmental agencies to select and develop quality control objectives. Leak testing requirements can vary drastically between agencies and locations. Now, one of the things we also wanted to show you is how to extract a vapor pen. And so I just have to get rid of the water with a syringe. And you might want to carry a syringe or a 
turkey baster with you. Okay, there's the syringe. So we'll suck out that water. Now one of the things that we've noticed about this uh, homemade uh, Play-Doh is it does, it does kind of turn a little bit sloppy on the inside. So once, once you get that done, you pull that out and you'll see it's kind of a little bit of a mess. So you pull that out, got some paper towels to clean that up. <laughs> All right. Now, to remove the vapor pens as easily as taken out a wine cork, first pull off your sample train and then you thread the installation extraction handle down onto the vapor pen. There you go. And you'll feel it engage. At that point, you just keep turning and the pin eventually works itself up into the handle and comes out. Uh, don't try and just pull those out because you will hurt your back there and they're really tight. And you can remove the sleeve, clean the pin, um, put a new sleeve on, and you're ready to go again. Just make sure you need to put a sleeve on each time to make sure you get that seal on initial installation. Thank you. Um, now we're going to share some information in regards to our product line. Everybody's familiar with the initial pins, but they come in um, brass, stainless, and the Flex VP. A lot of people ask if there's any difference between the brass and the stainless. Um, we initially made the brass just because it's a less expensive um, material to make. Um, regulators had requested that we start making them in stainless, especially because people were leaving them in longer and longer periods of time. If you have a really corrosive environment, that's when you know there may be some issues with the brass that it may, um, may be have a reaction and may be great. So, but we sell uh, about the same number of brass as we do to stainless. They install and work exactly the same way. That being said, um, our product line has grown with requests from our consumers such as yourself. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to us on the contact page if you have any questions or would like to see some additions to the product line. Um, for example, we'll start with several of them. People wanted to make additional connections. The Flex VP was born, which allows you to still make that barb connection, but then you can remo remove the Flex, v the Flex barb, and you have a top that now allows you to make those connections that we'll discuss here. So you can connect with a suede lock fitting on top. As I mentioned, you can connect with a TO17 to do some sampling with that. Um, we also have a quick connect so that you can connect with a um, directly with a bottle vac um, or um, pressure field extension monitoring. If you want to do that, they depend. We're, we're doing some testing in regards to pressure field extension testing. And you can connect directly to the quick connect that way, and that can uh, help you do some testing. With regards you can to leave that continuous if you want to, too. I mean, one of the ideas about the pressure testing is that eventually you'll want to predict when the time is to sample. And so you may put out uh, pressure field extension testing uh, equipment like this that, that goes up to the web and monitor your building for a while to see how it reacts and then have a bit better time of going in and collecting the correct samples. They're actually also asking for additional lines of ev evidence. And to do that, you want to monitor temperature, pressure, barometric pressure. Barometric pressure. So um, that the vapor pen allows you to sample all those different lines of evidence in a multitude of ways. The other thing that came across was people had shorter slabs, especially in the radon industry. Um, even in industrial industries, they're going into homes that have shorter slabs. They still wanted to utilize the vapor pen because of the sealing properties that it has and the reliability. Um, so the mini pin was born. The mini pin is uh, similar to the Flex VP and then it gives you all those variety of connections. The only difference with the mini pin is one, the silicone sleeve does not go up all the way like it does on the original pin. You also get it as an entire kit with a secure cover, silicone sleeve, and the pin itself all comes as one little mini kit. And the barb fitting. And the barb fitting. So this all comes as one little mini kit. Um, it is not reusable. Right now, there's not a way to get a hold of it. So as you can see um, here, the mini pin is installed. Um, so I'll take off the secure cover. So when you want to come back and do repeat monitoring, 
you would simply take off the cover and you can reattach your barb or your swage lock or your quick connect however you wanted to make that connection you can come back to the mini pin install that and when you're done remove it and put the secure cover back on yeah and these are meant to go in slabs as thin as two inches but, you but can they can be used in, in a, any situation really yeah you can use them any size um, and again one, one of the important things to remember is this this pin has to be perpendicular to the slab and so that's we have that um, drilling guide specifically designed uh, for when when you want to use the mini pin now that being said um, if you're using a mini pin I don't know that I necessarily would re re suggest that you use it in a dry cleaner site because you may be concerned that your slabs are saturated with chlorinated solvents if, if that's the case we have a sealing extension that you can utilize to make sure you're getting a representative sample from underneath the slab and not the slab itself depending on the depth of your slab you can either use these one and a half inch extensions and you can add on as many as you need um, and then you can put on the ceiling extension we also have filters and sieves so this is a filter and then we have um, sieves that you can put on the bottom as well and those are designed so that if you do encounter the, the subgrade and it's and it's fine grained it doesn't plug up the hole in the bottom of the vapor pen so the sieve allows uh, the air to enter from the sides Right. So then you'd install and not only you sealing off the slab itself, but you're sealing off the bottom of the slab so you can make sure you get your representative sample from the slab. Now there's also um, people that wanted to sample at a specific depth. So we have a barb fitting that you can thread into the bottom of the vapor pin, put in a stainless steel tube as long as you need. Again, there's a small piece of tubing here that you can put the filter or the sieve at the bottom of that, but um, it's another way just to obtain if you need to get to a specific depth. Now you can hook that up to other kinds of tubing like Nyloflow or Tigon, but we find that stainless steel is a little bit better because it doesn't tend to curl up on you when you're trying to fit it down inside the hole. We currently are testing because we came across a client that went into a paint factory for painting automobiles and they were not allowed to bring any type of silicone into the building. It didn't, have, didn't matter if it was on clothing, gloves, no silicone whatsoever. So um, this is a new kind of sleeve that we're in testing mode um, to test out because then it can be used in those places where silicone is just not allowed. allowed. Yeah. So because there is no issues with the silicone, it, those have been tested actually by Chevron and, and other companies and it all tests the fine. Another thing that's currently in testing is high volume. Yeah, so, so to help with high volume sampling, we wanted to have a couple of things happen. One is we wanted to stick with the same tooling we had before. Uh, so a one and a half inch bit that you were drilling for your flush mount, now you can drill all the way through the slab and use it for this uh, large diameter uh, sample. It's basically a cam lock fitting on the top and a vapor pin uh, look to the sides. Pound that in, you'll be able to use that for uh, your high volume sampling that you connect up then to a shop vac. And so we have the cam fittings that you can buy and the connections back to the shop vac. Uh, at the end of this tubing, at the end of this tube, you'll have to make your own uh, connect to mate up to your shop vac because they're all a little bit different, but you, you can get those kind of, of uh, couplings. And Roger Brewer from Hawaii is uh, <laughs> the customer that requested yeah, that. Right. Um, and then you saw our, uh, this is our vapor pin insert. It can be utilized pre-construction or post-construction. It's um, used to sample underneath vapor barriers. Um, so the threaded rod goes to the soil where you want your point to be. Um, then it, this can go threaded up and down till you get to your specific depth. You're gonna marry it up to the vapor barrier in the liner following the manufacturer's recommendations, just like any other plumbing insert. And then you're gonna pour the concrete. And once you get the concrete poured and it um, sets, you can pull the top off and now you have a point for your vapor pin. And um, with the vapor pin installed, you can pick whether you want whatever type of pin, regular or flex VP, but the secure cover does engage with that vapor pin too, so it keeps it nice and secure in between sampling events. This is our contractor's kit. That's where everybody generally starts because it has 10 pins, 10 covers, 20 sleeves, enough to get you two samplings before you um, need to, because these are your only consumables, are the silicone sleeves in a bag of 20 and the caps in a bag of 20 as well.
Hi, everybody. I uh, hope the video was informative. We look forward to answering your questions. And now we're going to share some case studies um, that we have as well for best data practices. So we're going to go through, uh, you know, some source characterization. This first uh, case study takes you from the source characterization, where we actually invented the vapor pen, all the way through mitigation of the system and now the long-term monitoring of the, of the building. Then we have a couple of uh, ones on conceptual site model, how you can use uh, vapor pens to help you refine that. And then there's some pre-demolition uh, site characterization that uh, turned out to be very handy. We, we do a lot of that kind of stuff for large buildings for clients. And then we'll talk a little bit about due diligence. So let's, so let's start at started. the beginning. Yeah. So as Craig mentioned, this is where the actual vapor pen was um, invented. And this site went straight from source characterization and screening all the way through the long-term monitoring. So let's talk about the site itself. So the issues we had, uh, it was a chlorinated uh, groundwater plume that exited uh, beneath the building. Um, and we took a lot of time to uh, try and figure out where the source was. Uh, but then as in the end, uh, the client wanted us to go in and actually just know everything about the building uh, because it, they were going to leave or, or tear it down or do something. Or if it, if the source was in the in a place they could get at it, uh, they'd they'd stay there. So uh, it, it had been an active site, industrial site since 1938, and it had a very long history of solvent use, lots of solvents back then, and they used them liberally. Yes. Um, the assessment was restricted to evening hours. Um, and we could only go in once, we couldn't leave anything in place, which brought to light why we couldn't use anything that was already in the market. And this was back in 2010, um, yeah. because we started selling the vapor van in mid-2011. So we were <coughs> testing it and refining it um, at this site to because we couldn't leave anything in or use what was already available. So the pre-assessment, we talked to the uh, environmental people at the site, <clears throat> and they indicated, you know, that there was there was a, a degreaser, a couple of degreasers, and some above-ground storage tanks that had been used in the past. They they weren't using solvents at the time, uh, so they they sort of pointed us in the direction of where we should go. Um, ground depth to groundwater was 20 to 30 feet, depending on the floor heights changed quite a bit in the building. Um, and then it was on, in a clay setting with uh, sand and gravel beneath. The assessment turned out to be yeah. 156 pens uh, in a week. But remember, we could only go in at night and we had a specific amount of time. So we generally would do 20 to 30 in the evening, but that included drilling, installation, sampling, extraction, and filling in the holes. So, and again, this uh, wanted to know everything about the building, which is why we did so many, um, so that we could understand in case they were going to either tear it down or shut down the facility. Uh, we used a multi-gas meter to uh, purge with, and what we saw is when, when we purged, um, oxygen content tended to go down and the VOC content came up, and so we knew it was time to sample, and it only took about 30 seconds yep. per point. Uh, we were a little confused about some of the oxygen content because we thought we were having leaks, and yet we got pretty good VOC return. So uh, as we plotted that out, what we realized is that the oxygen content was showing us preferential pathways. So sewer lines coming into the building, water lines, communication lines, gas lines, those kind of things, uh, you, you're able to sort of map them out a little bit uh, just by looking at the oxygen content. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, um, as vapor intrusion has expanded throughout throughout the years, preferential pathways has become really something you should pay attention to, especially sewer lines and sewer gas, because sometimes, especially in homes and buildings, those can be uh, most the primary, source, the primary yeah. source of your vapor intrusion issue. So these were our PID readings, and they indicated that the contamination was not in the areas that they had originally suspected and was pointing us towards, which is why it was very beneficial that we were using that PID to do screenings, and as you'll see... And, they, that, and that we looked at all the sites. Right. We looked at the whole building. The whole we, building. We just didn't go to where they told us to look for things because we wouldn't have found anything. Yes, no. If we would have went to where they directed us, it, it would have not been way off kilter. But the PID, we'll show you how well it correlates with the soil gas readings. So sub-slab soil gas from each pen were collected using a syringe. We used a, a field um, no, sort lab. Of a field lab bag. 
method. It was uh, we could have had a uh, you know kind of a mobile lab on site, but when we finally talked to him, we said, well, why don't you just give us the bottles and we'll ship them to you overnight, and it saved a lot of cost. Uh, so it was it really worked out well. So this was PCE, and this was TCE, and we were a little confused because they said they'd never used TCE, so we figured it was possibly degradation. And then this was actually after we got back the soil gas results, we were able to do a focused soil sampling campaign, and we utilized those soil gas samples to locate that. So we, we started digging, and at first, the lower depths, we weren't finding anything. But we located uh, Dean Apple at 15 feet just screaming. So just taking that little sip of air at the top, you know, we were, one, saved time instead of drilling yeah, all over the yeah. place. It was an active facility, so yeah. you know it, it really was an effort to get in and drill next to people's desks and things like that. So it was it was a little tough. Now it, it turned out that most of the if you, if you look at the red dots are TCE and the blue dots are PCE, it turned out that the Dean apple was mostly PCE or TCE, and they had no record they ever used TCE at all. So it was obvious that they used it at some point. And so we tried to look, how, how could we figure out w when they used it? And we looked back at aerial photography. Well, before we go to aerial photography, this is another best practice. Don't limit your um, yeah. ZOC list. You know, don't just do for the constituents of concern. Because, again, if we would have done that where they said, well, we never used TCE, then we would have been quite uh, perplexed at that point as well. So expand your list and because um, you may find something that, you didn't know to begin with. Yeah, so so when we looked at uh, the, the relationship to what the building looked like in 1950, it, it just mirrored, you know, where loading docks were, the back door, the, you know, the north edge of the facility, that kind of stuff. And what they were doing back then was what was recommended by ASTM and other standards was to take uh, the, the used solvent outside and just dump it on the ground. And so that's what, that's what they did. Yep. So then we went into a vapor intrusion assessment where we completed an inventory of indoor air sources. We identified and sealed all the sub-slab soil gas entry points. Yeah, and we, we collected an indoor air uh, screening data using a HAP site, which is a, a field GC. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to use. It's kind of temperamental, but uh, it provided us with information so that we could move forward with uh, indoor air sampling. Um, did the typical indoor air and sub-slab paired samples. Uh, we used individually clean certified SUMA cans for the indoor air samples. We had the replicates. We took ambient air samples. Important to do that, you know, outside, upwind and downwind if you can. Uh, and one of the things we learned that uh, we've now found to be very useful, all the other chlorinated sites we work on is if you detect cis-1,2 dichloroethene in the indoor air, that means you have vapor intrusion. And the reason we're so confident about that is because that compound is not in any uh, commercial products. It, it only occurs from the degradation of TCE in, in the subsurface. So knowing that if you have cis, it, both indoor air and in subslab, you can use that to, to calculate what your attenuation factor is. And, and it's, it's very, very useful. So if one thing you take away from this is to look for that compound. So then we went in to remediate the site. Um, we used a soil vapor extraction and emulsified zero valent iron. Um, some of those same pins that we used for screening and for the vapor intrusion we used for the assessment to understand the VI potential. And then we used it in mitigation and um, testing for the sub-slab depressurization system. So those pins have been in since 2010. They're still in, still being used to monitor the system, and they still don't leak. So that's the, the same pen that's been in there for 10 yep. years. So next, we're, this is Lori's, <laughs> this is Lori's <laughs> favorite it. site. Uh, I, I like out. this site because it's, it, yeah. was, it, was, uh, it was quick, yeah. and, and the client was very happy, and it was very cost-effective. Um, it, it was a source of a vapor intrusion in a 60,000-square-foot building. The previous consultant had evaluated it for two years, and they could not locate the source. So... They couldn't provide them with a conceptual site model that they could move forward with it was, mitigation. It was ready for redevelopment, yes. and uh, all they had to do was find the source so they could mitigate it, and they just worked uh, on it for no. two years. They were not, the, you know, the owner was not happy because he, right. he couldn't finish it out, and it was ready to go. So these, uh, the yellow triangles are the soil borings, and the red circles are monitor wells where the previous consultant had taken their samples. 
Um, so we wanted to show you that so you knew where they were taking their samples. We came in and we installed, screened, sampled, and abandoned 90 vapor pin sampling points in two days. And again, the owner wanted to say, look, I want you to tell me everything about the site. They can't locate it. And 90 pins didn't take us much. So again, we used the PID to screen the site. Um, this is PCE. They had no issues with TCE, and this was TCA. So within a week, we were able to tell them where the source was, provide them with a conceptual site model, allowing those mitigation efforts to proceed. And just to remind you, they, this is where the source was. They took one soil boring, soil boring yeah. sample because it was a receptionist desk at the time, but it used to be a machine shop. But that's not even the issue. The issue is they took, they didn't take a soil gas sample. Right, yeah, so they were trying to understand what the issue was but without taking a soil gas yeah, sample. So if you're going to do a vapor intrusion assessment, yes. <laughs> make sure you collect some vapors. That's, <laughs> yes. that's basically the takeaway from that one. Yes. Uh, this was a pre-demolition site. This was a site that goes back to the 1800s and uh, manufactured all kinds of neat stuff, had a great history. Uh, but its history had run its course, and they were ready to, to demolish it for to put up an apartment complex or something like that. And so we were hired by the uh, client uh, to see if if they had any surprises underneath the slab that, that, that they could avoid. It had a long history of petroleum storage and sort of an unknown history of solvent use since we got there and it was abandoned and there wasn't a lot of people around that knew kind of what went on. But we had some historical data about petroleum. And so this is where the petroleum sources sat. And uh, that blue kind of line going through there is a canal from the old canal systems that ran through Ohio uh, in the late 1800s. And so some of those actually dated back that far, you know, where they had petroleum, uh, you know, big tank sitting next to the canal. Uh, so we went in and we guess what we put in we 90. 90. <laughs> that was just a coincidence. Yeah, we, we did 90 <laughs> locations in two days again. Yes, uh, it's something that we like to do, I guess. <laughs> Um, and this is what the PID readings look like. Now, by this time, we've we've gotten used to the idea that the PID is pretty predictive. It's, it's, it's very accurate. I mean, yeah. it, it's it's a great screening tool, and it, it's really, as you had seen, they correlate really well. So we could really pinpoint, and we only took five samples here at these yeah, so five locations. That's sent to the lab, and and the results came back favorable. So uh, they could move along with demolition. Um, they demolished the site, uh, they, they saved a ton of money because they didn't have to uh, do an extensive drilling program or anything, but then they lost out because uh, yeah. the roof was completely filled, filled with, with asbestos. asbestos. Yeah, so <laughs> that one, we, 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 they didn't ask us to look for asbestos. Yeah, we but. couldn't do anything about that. But, but the, when it was sold, the developer came in and actually completed some soil borings, but again, they, didn't, they failed to locate any additional sources, so really that screening tool was a great way to do that. Yep. And the owner was so happy that he asked us to go out to Oklahoma and do another site that he had. Yeah, now this was a big building. This is a half million square feet, and it had been um, heavy manufacturing for its entire life. I mean, they made airplanes and all kinds of things there, um, but they didn't understand their VOC issues. So. Uh, this one took a little bit more time, so we had to send out a four-man team, four-person team, uh, and put in uh, 275 vapor pins in four days. Now, if you'll notice on the grid spacing, yeah. um, because the pins go in so easily and you can utilize that PID for a screening tool, you can start your grid pretty wide, especially if you're trying to screen your site. And as you can see on the left of that site map, we started to put them in a little bit tighter because we, we saw some high readings that we thought we might want to really keen in on. So we started putting making our grid spacing tighter. So that's just something to think about. But after using the GIS and whatnot. Right. So we had that. that this was a, the LEL readings. And then the next map, if you want to go to that, yeah, that's the PID readings. And so there was, there was some place, you know, some areas of interest. And so we collected some samples and uh, sent those to the lab and, and identified a few places beneath the slab that they needed to be careful of uh, when, when they started to tear the building down. So, that, again, that worked out very well for them. That essentially, it was in pretty good shape. Yeah, and so we saved them time and money and uncertainty, knowing it's a great way to fully understand what's underneath the yeah. building. I think the building slab may still be there because yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people tend to leave them in place. But at least they know there's nothing underneath there to scare them if somebody comes along and wants to develop. But to buy it or develop it. Yep. 
Let's talk about some due diligence. Yeah, this was a site that, uh, and this one, this one really goes fast because uh, there just isn't a whole lot to talk <laughs> well, about. Well, it, it. not only did it go fast, but the project went fast. Yeah. We did this literally in half a day. Yeah, and, and what happened was a, a company bought a portfolio of sites that were apartment complexes across the United States, and a few of them happened to be within uh, the footprint of where a dry cleaner used to be, and this was one of them. And so they were very reluctant on letting us collect any samples during the phase one, which you typically don't do. Or but inside, too. They didn't and, want us to go inside. Yeah, they didn't want us to go inside, but we convinced them that, well, we, can we go in the asphalt, uh, you know, parking areas around the outside of the building? Uh, because, you know, we, we want to just get a quick grab sample. So by uh, we got there at the site maybe 10 o'clock, and by noon, we already understood that there was a, a PCE issue from the dry cleaner and that it probably was a vapor intrusion issue at the site. And so we went back to the client and, and uh, discussed it with them, and they convinced the owner to let us in and take one indoor air and sub-slab paired sample. So we did that, and we found that it was just screaming high underneath the slab. It was in the indoor air, but not quite at the at the level of concern but it could easily go go over that level in a different season or anything like that so what we did was we convinced them you know this is only a few days of work but we convinced them to put in escrow enough money for a vapor mitigation system turned out they had a lot of radon issues too so they solved both problems solved both problems at the same time but they had to do the whole building so, and, and this brings up another point is, you know, the vapor pen does install in any hard surface. So you can install it in asphalt. You, um, we have a lot of customers that install them on the top of landfills to test for, for methane. Um, they put them on the sides of buildings to test in the basement. Um, they, <laughs> anywhere there's a hard surface, you can install a pen. We've been pretty surprised um, at the thoughts and what people have gone to use the vapor pens, but they, they are very effective. So that was the areas, just a few samples that we took, but, you know, it was just a PID. Yeah. So gave us some information. So with that, we're ready for questions. And we thank you and for we your thank attention. you for your time and your attention. So. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. And we'll thanks turn on our video so we can say hi yeah. to everybody. <laughs> well, I'll sit up straight then. <laughs> so I'm going to be on TV. I'll turn on my... Uh, Video as well. <laughs> Scary sight, I know. But uh, we'll <laughs> no. we'll uh, start filtering so any questions you guys might have. Um, I guess I'll. I had uh, just a question to kick things off, um, but just a question I get asked uh, a bit uh, is uh, how do you guys go about sort of planning? Uh, from the beginning, where to grid your VPs and sort of the quantity needed for a site? Um, you know, what's the typical sort of spacing that you guys typically use and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, when we first started, those uh, first samples were every 15 feet. So that was, you know, that's how we ended up with 156 points in that one building. But if you go to, you know, a 450,000 square foot building, uh, you know, it's just not practical to do that. And so um, you sort of judge it on the initial grid being a little bit wider and start to, with a PID and then fill in places. It, it's, it's uh, in big buildings, that's about the only way you can do it. But for most, most buildings that are going to be normal size buildings, you know, 15 to 20 feet or uh, what's that, three to 10 meters. Yeah, like you're that. asking me. <laughs> should be, should be uh, sufficient to, yes. to get you going. And again, you can always fill it back in when, when, right. you, uh, when you start to get results. Yeah, you, so you can start wide and as you use the PID, you can uh, yeah. you know, condense your grid as needed. That, that's okay. the, the beauty of the pins going in so quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. One, of um, the you, one of the things yeah. you have to be careful though yeah. is, is you do want to uh, make sure you're not drilling through any, you know, conduit and water lines and all that kind of stuff. So if you can have uh, somebody come in with a GPR and kind of, they have some little units that are pretty good for, for thin concrete. 
uh, you can actually see the view bar and everything uh, within the, you know, right below you, so you can avoid any issues. But you should you should clear all the locations. You don't want to hit anything. Yeah, that would that's, uh, that's something we definitely recommend prior to doing <laughs> to that. Uh, we sort of have <laughs> a, a rule of thumb that uh, we need a we need a screen prior to uh, of what's going on underneath before we we start drilling through. Um, got a question. Uh, Giuseppe has asked, so what's the most common outdoor applications um, that uh, that you guys see for, for the vape bins? Uh, outdoor, outdoor, definitely. Uh, they use them a lot at gas stations to sample for petroleum. Um, and asphalt, we, we've installed pins um, in asphalt in Italy to locate chlorinated solvents as well. And for example, the the due diligence that we did when you're not allowed in the site and you can install the vapor pins on the concrete apron, aprons around the building. So it's a great way to understand yeah. if you've got some problems if you're not allowed in at the moment. We've, to, done, uh, we've done some on sidewalks and on uh, driveway aprons and those kind of things. I mean, if you look back at the sort of um, uh, flux chamber kind of approach, you know, a lot of Flux chambers are kind of coming back a little bit uh, because the instrumentation is a little bit easier to use now and stuff. But, you know, there's VOCs coming out of the ground everywhere. And, and so they just put a little flux chamber over that and, and, you know, can detect them. So if you have any bit of, of hard surface like a sidewalk or a driveway or anything like that, it's surprising the amount of, of information you can get just by sampling the gas underneath that. Okay. Um there is uh, some other questions here that uh, I'm unable to see, but Michelle's going to send them through. Um, you mentioned oh, before I, that I can see I can see one of them, Kyle. There's one that you I don't know if this is one. Your large number of gridded locations. Did you sample all those, or was it screened via PID to choose sampling locations? Were individual pins used for each locations, or pins extracted and reused the same assessment? Ah, yes. That's and those, yeah, that's a good one. In the large gridded ones, we did um, remove them, clean them, and reuse them again. So we didn't go out there with 275 pins. Actually, we might have in um, Oklahoma, because we didn't have a way to clean them, because we were way out on site from Ohio. But here, in this, when we were here in, on Ohio, we would only use the 30, we'd come back, we'd clean them, and we'd take them and reuse them. So you have both options available. Yeah. And the PID and that Oklahoma and large space was used to help us choose the sampling locations. Yep, yep. So that's a good good question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you, there's a couple of others here, sort of, um, how do you, do you have a concrete like flush mount lid for heritage listed sites where visual impacts of sampling have to be considered? interesting ah, that's a new one. That, that's a new one a concrete but you know we can add that to our line yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I mentioned you know our line has grown based on the needs of our customers so um that is definitely something we can th yeah, we'll to add, think that. about it yeah yeah great okay um so another one here is uh, it's very interesting to hear that the uh, pic readings correlated well with the svp results for tce and daughter products, as I would have thought PIDs won't be as sensitive to TCE and its daughter products. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, the... Um, they don't give you actual readings, but you yeah, I mean the spike. The PID uh, at that site, I, you know, if you noticed, we could go back through there, but the, the TCE that we saw at first um, was a little bit uh, diminished, I guess, the returns we got from the um, well, no, that was from the analytical. No, that was. That, that yes, was no, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I too, we've been yeah. using PIDs for so long that. Um, but I mean, that's what they do. It's, it's they the total. Know. It's the total VOC content. So it's a little bit. You know, it might be. You know, if you just had a TCE site, you might have a little bit of a, a lowered sensitivity, but uh, that just hasn't happened. It's with, not uh, happened with us. It's worked. Yeah. And we do a lot of sites. Yeah, we do. A, we do a lot of sites. sites. Okay. Um, another question here from Chen. Uh, what's, uh, what's advantages of screening uh, using sub-slab uh, soil vapor pins versus shallow drilling soil bores? Um, I think the main um, advantage is that you can collect a high-resolution sample set within hours. 
And so if you're trying to do this with soil bores and, and put in a, you know, maybe put something in and let bentonite, you know, swell up or, or actually cement them into the, into the concrete, uh, into the slab, you know, then you got another day, you got to wait for that to set up. And so it, it's just the advantage of speed. Well, it's not only speed, but um, also less chances of leaks. Um, yeah. we, we have white papers that demonstrate side-by-side -side testing with soil bores and the vapor pens. Right. And, um, I mean, we have correlation graphs that will actually show you, and, and you can find those on our website, that show you that side-by-side -side testing. Um, and we did a side-by-side -side testing with Michigan's um, MDEQ, and a lot of their points broke, and they actually just used our data with the vapor pens because they couldn't use theirs. Yeah, that's the, that was the, um, you know, when we first came out, there was a lot of questions about, you know, uh, you know, this, is this really work? You know, it seemed too easy. And uh, so we did these side-by-side -side tests with um, implants and with uh, yep. little stainless steel um, AMS kind of approach and, and found that the, the data is the data. Yep. Um, it's, it's just you're able to collect more of it, so you get mm -hmm. a better site characterization in the end. More data and more efficient data. Yeah and reliable data. Yep. Um, Grant Marshall's just asked, what if the site is currently undeveloped? So, so no hard stand, but a development is proposed. So are there methods that can be deployed to screen for vapors when a sub slab is not established? Um, with the vapor pen, no. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, it's, it, that's the only um, we have, we have, requirement. We have one being, uh, we have something being tested yeah, it's, that might have a solution for yeah, that. It's tough. But, you know, there are things like flux chambers that are, are like I said earlier, they're kind of making a comeback. Um, in Italy, they're using them quite a bit with some, uh, with good results. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, originally, um, the whole, the whole passive sampling um, ideas came along because people were trying to track uh, petroleum plumes from gas stations using those, and they worked very, very well in the '80s and stuff. They were doing that, mm -hmm. so the passive uh, in the outdoor settings probably still a one of the better ways to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have had a, a client here in Australia use sort of the custom uh, long sort of one meter uh, stainless steel extension yeah. with a filter. Uh, yep. on the end for yep. sort of uh, soil analysis while still using the the vapor pin which has been a, a nifty little uh, a nifty little idea so that was yeah. uh, that was an interesting one um, and yeah, I think the you think they use it yeah in soil. The, the thing that's um, always been a frustration for us is that when you're beneath the slab you have a very good chance you're going to have some kind of granular material right beneath the slab so you can get airflow Mm -hmm. And in in where we're, where we live, uh, it's all glaciated and it's a lot of clay and stuff. And so if you get down to five feet, you're you're lucky. And then when you get mm -hmm. down there, it's probably so tight you can't get any air out of it, anyways. Sure. So that's kind of why yeah, it's, it yeah, depends it's, on the yeah, it really depends on what the geology is like. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, have a couple of yeah. people asking, uh, what's the best practice cleaning method um, between uses of the pins? Uh, yeah, we, we actually, that's in our SOPs. We, we clean them in um, a, a cleaning solution in a sonic cleaner. And, but yeah, then again, we're cleaning them straight from the manufacturer. So we're, we clean them and we dry them off and then we put them in an oven and we cook them for so many minutes, different for the brass and the stainless. But you can find those in the SOPs yeah. um, you, for it's, those pins. It, it's the same as most other things. I mean, you can use Alkanox and, yeah. and just heat them up you know, under a heat lamp if you wanted to. You need to burn off wanted, the VOCs. Yeah, you just want to burn off any VOCs. And they, you know, they don't really stick. They're not that sticky, so yep. that's mm -hmm. not big. But, but you need to use a new sleeve every time. Yeah. That's the most important thing. You have to use a new sleeve every time. Even if you pull the sleeve out and it looks pretty good, don't do it because you don't, one, yeah, you don't want to. It loses a little bit of its structural integrity yeah. if you put them in the same sleeve a couple of times as well. So it'll get kind of really sort of rubbery instead of stiff. Yep. Right. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chris Ford's asked, uh, in what situation would you use uh, the flex vapor pin over one of your sort of standard brass or stainless ones? If you wanted to make a different type of connection, like there's some people that want to use a swage lock connection, um, then you'd go to, you'd have to use the flex because you can't connect the swage lock 
or if you wanted to like test for um, mercury and you wanted to connect the TO17, um, you can use the flex vapor pin for that also because, again, you, you yeah. can't make that connection. Or if you yeah, wanted to connect the bottle vac, um, you know, that, that you can, we sell this quick connect separately and that, again, connects to the flex VP. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was, uh, there's, there's also an advantage if you're going to do continuous monitoring and you want to make sure your port doesn't kind of come loose or something because you're not there to watch it all the time. Yep. Uh, you could use the, the swage lock fitting in there because it's a little bit more secure. Yep. Especially if you're going to leave it for weeks and weeks and monitor yep. pressure or, or chemicals or whatever. And I've also just had people that prefer to have a really secure um, connection, uh, you know, where they prefer the flex with, say, the swage lock fitting um, right. uh, rather than, uh, you know, the, the tubing in between the barb and, the, and their sample tubing. Uh, yep. as well yeah. so personal preference and, as and well a, and a lot of that a lot of times that's kind of dictated by the agency in, in the states you know we have 50 states and probably 60 regular <laughs> 60 different ways to do things because it's just everybody came up with their own regular you know their own sort of guidance and um so really kind of depends on what the regulator wants wants you to yeah. use. some of them really want to use swage lock mm -hmm. Um, I think that's filtering the majority of the questions there. Um, I'll just uh, also mention as well um, a bit more locally that uh, we also uh, at Hydroterra, obviously we, we stock um, quite a few of the, the contractor kits and um, the standard kits, uh, both in brass and stainless, uh, as well as the flex pins, pretty much everything, you know, um, the majority of the products you've seen in the, in the video presentation uh that laurie and uh, craig did that we uh we stock uh, all of that at hydro terror as well as well as uh, a bit of a rental fleet for all of the um, methods on how to collect your samples so your pids the helium shrouds that sort of thing uh, are in our, our rental fleet so we sort of have that full uh sweep as well um if anybody uh, needed to reach out um so we always make sure we have uh, plenty of stock uh, of the vapor pins um in all forms um so i think that uh has filtered the majority of the questions there um oh, through... the hydro provides leak testing equipment like helium shrouds yeah they do mm. yes, they do so, yeah. yep they do they just you answered it just as they were asking the question yeah. Good yes. job, guys. <laughs> okay there you go preemptive <laughs> So uh, yes, no, we do. Any uh, any of the equipment used to uh, collect your samples uh, from the pins, uh, we we definitely have in our rental fleet. So um, feel free to reach out. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, I think the yeah. biggest thing that's happening here in the states now is that uh, people are putting in barriers, and the agencies have gone back later and said, "Well, I want to know what's going on beneath the barrier," and so mm -hmm. that's why we invented that insert. And um, if it hasn't come to uh, Australia, Australia yet, it probably yet, will. <laughs> probably. Mm. Will. I don't know if it has, but but so we, we've worked with GeoSeal and um, Stell, Vago, Vago and Regenesis, Land Science. Right. To, to uh, come up with this product that uh, allows you to, to do that. It's best done pre-construction. Yeah, but it can be done post. Yeah. It's just a little mm. more cumbersome. And, and the yeah. idea is that, um, you know, when you're doing your mitigation it's just that it's just mitigation and so the agency wants to know when can we tell you it's able to be turned off and uh, so that's why they want you to be able to sample underneath there and is it still being effective at, at getting a pressure differential out far enough uh, for your site because sometimes the soils dry out underneath and and the pressure regime changes a little bit you might have to adjust a fan or something but uh, that's what yeah. they're about. But, so expect that to keep coming down the pipe at you someday. Yep. yep. We're interested in deeper TC impacts at two depths. Well, uh, well, like we mentioned, even taking that sip of air at the top, we located the source deep down. So, um, and and we didn't use any extensions when we located that D apple 15 feet down. Um, it was just a, a vapor pen. There was nothing underneath of it. But yes, you can with those other extensions that we have, you know, and putting the stainless steel rod underneath the pen, 
with the sieves and the filters. Yeah, so if you go back to just the, the original days of doing soil gas prospecting, um, it was it was actually invented in Pittsburgh to locate petroleum, so like raw crude petroleum sources so that they could predict where to drill for oil wells. And then it went from there, it you know turned into tracking plumes of Elnapple, uh, so you know many many feet down, and then vapor intrusion kind of came along. And so you're you, you know it is vapor intrusion. It's coming from a deeper source, coming through the soil, and getting you know beneath the building, and then eventually getting in the building. So if you're, you know if if you just believe that's really happening, which it does, then you don't need to really get too deep. Yeah. And I think. There was a, the original guidance that US EPA put out, you know, you sort of started at groundwater, then you had a deep sample, and then a kind of a shallower sample, and then, you, you know, below the slab, but you never went indoors because you didn't want to go in and mess with people's, uh, you know, personal spaces and things. Um, I, I think that that's kind of evolved to the point now where it's just sub-slab. If you do sub-slab, that's the last point before it gets in the building. Um, and if you got an issue there, then you probably do have an issue in the building. So that's that's kind of how it's evolving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think with that um, we've filtered all the questions here. So um, I'll just quickly mention too that if if there's a project that you guys have that has a large number of vapor pins, I just wanted to flag that the the turnaround time for us to uh, procure um the vapor pins is really is quite quick um sort of a week uh turnaround time uh for any sort of larger ores that you may have um so that's something that's really handy and really uh really efficient from from the guys at vapor pin um so thanks laurie and craig for having that really quick turnaround yeah. time that's great um but with that i think we might uh wrap it up uh here so um Really do appreciate uh, your time today, Laurie and Craig, and everybody uh, who has attended. Um, and of course, uh, our, my details are on the screen there. Uh, if you uh, have any other questions or anything to reach out for, um, it's been a great presentation today, and I uh, really do appreciate everyone uh, attending. So, thank you all very much, and um, thank you. Enjoy, enjoy uh, the rest yeah. of your night, <laughs> Laurie and Craig. I know it's late. Um, so really appreciate well, we, we always like hearing from we always like to hear from people living in the future <laughs> yeah. we're stuck here in the past we don't even know it's going to go you know you can tell us what's going on now. <laughs> yeah, tell us what's going to happen tomorrow <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely yeah i don't think we even know ourselves what's going to happen tomorrow uh, so yeah thanks everyone well, thank you very much thanks for having us much. yep okay. take care everybody bye thank you, you. Bye. bye bye bye